Hello everybody and welcome to another YouTube video. So in today's video, I'm going to be showing you the Python web framework known as Fast API. Now, as the name suggests, what this web framework lets you do is create APIs in Python. The reason it's named Fast API is because you can make APIs very, very quickly. In fact, we can write our first API in about four or five lines of code. And then these APIs are very quick themselves. They have a very high performance. With that said, this video is not designed for absolute beginners. You should have some knowledge with Python. However, I will explain to you what an API is. I'll talk about the common API kind of methods. So get, post, uh, put, patch, update, all of those kind of ones. And I will discuss JSON and just kind of how an API works. So if you're unfamiliar with APIs, don't worry, but you should have some knowledge of Python to be able to follow along. So with that said, let's dive in after a quick word from our sponsor. Before we get started, I need to thank Intel for sponsoring this video and having me talk to you about their OpenVINO toolkit and the Intel Dev Cloud for the Edge. The OpenVINO toolkit is free software that helps developers and data scientists speed up computer vision and AI workloads, streamline deep learning inference and deployments, and enable heterogeneous execution across Intel's platform from Edge to Cloud. On the OpenVINO website, you can find free resources like a tutorial on how to perform a style transfer using a deep learning model and a cheat sheet containing everything you need to know to get your AI application up and running as fast as possible. If you want to get started with the OpenVINO toolkit, you can use Intel Dev Cloud for the Edge. This is a cloud-based development sandbox that gives developers access to the latest Intel Edge hardware and software to build, test, and prototype their AI applications. With these technologies and resources, you can build, optimize, and deploy your applications with ease. Start building your AI and machine learning applications today by clicking the link in the description and taking advantage of the OpenVINO toolkit. Thanks again to Intel for sponsoring this video. All right, so as we end the video here, the first thing I'll mention is that there is timestamps linked below. If you want to skip to a certain part in the video or you want to kind of skip through the more beginner explanations, maybe if you're more advanced. Regardless, I'm going to start here by discussing kind of the core advantages of Fast API and why you may actually want to use it. So Fast API is very fast to make an API with, right? The name is very fitting. And one of the reasons for that is that when you create an API in Fast API, you're actually going to be defining the types of all of the data that your API is expecting. So traditionally, when you write an API or some web framework or something or, or web app, whatever in Python, you don't actually explicitly set what type all of the information that your endpoints, so kind of a URL on the server, are going to be accepting. Now, what that means is you have to do a ton of data validation. You have to check to ensure that, you know, you actually got an integer or you got a string or you got some JSON object or something like that. And while this is kind of a lot of grunt work and you're just writing a ton of stuff to essentially check that the information that was sent to your API is correct. Now, in fast API, all of this is actually automatically done for you. So if someone sends the wrong piece or wrong type of information to your API endpoint, it will automatically return to them kind of an error message saying, hey, you know, this was supposed to be an integer and I got a string, whatever. But that's kind of the first main advantage of fast API is it does all of this data validation for you, because when you create endpoints with fast API, you're going to define explicitly what type all of the information that's going to be past that endpoint will be. So whether that's a path parameter, a query parameter, or actually the kind of uh, request body, you're going to define exactly what that should look like. So fast API can automatically handle the data validation. Next thing that's great about fast API is that it auto documents your entire API. So since you are actually giving all of the types for what's expected for the API, fast API can automatically generate documentation that also works as kind of like a test script. So I'll show you this in a second, but it actually generates a web page that you or maybe your front end engineer, if someone else is working on this, could go to to see all of the API endpoints and exactly what they expect and any description or information that you would have provided for them. And then last thing, since you're defining the types of all of these kind of all of this information related to the endpoints, you're going to get really good auto completion. So if you're working in an actual IDE like VS Code or PyCharm, I'm not doing that right here. I'm in sublime text. Then you get really good auto completion and just better completions that you would typically have because of the fact you're defining these types. So anyways, enough talking. Let's get into it. The first thing we need to do is install fast API. So if you're on Windows, open up a uh, command prompt. If you are on Mac or Linux, open up terminal and you're going to type the following command pip install fast API to install the fast API module. If for some reason this doesn't work for you, try the following command. You can see I already have this uh, requirement satisfied. Try pip three install fast API. 
If that doesn't work for you, try Python hyphen M pip install fast API. If that doesn't work for you, try Python three hyphen M pip install. If none of those work for you, then go to the links in the description. I'll have a video for Mac and a video for Windows showing you how to fix this command. Now, once we've installed fast API, I'm going to assume you've done that at this point, we're going to install something called UV corn. Now, this is what we're actually going to use to run our API kind of as like a web server, which you'll see in a minute. But regardless, you need UV corn as well. Again, if this command doesn't work, try those sequences, pip3, Python M, so on and so forth. All right, so we can leave the command prompt open. We'll be using that later. Then what we need to do is open up a Python file in some editor. For me, I'm working in some directory that's on my desktop. It's called Fast API. You can kind of see it at the top left-hand corner of my screen for the path for this file. I just have a Python file called working.py. Obviously, place yours wherever you want, name it whatever you want, but make sure you know where it is because you are going to have to kind of access that. All right, so now what we're going to do is make sure our fast API installation is working. So we're just going to import fast API, save our script, run it. I'm running mine with control B in sublime text, and you can see that we got no errors. And so we're all good. Fast API is installed. So now we're going to write kind of our first API. I'll go through this fairly quickly, just showing you how to set this up. And then I'll kind of walk through each line and discuss what I did. So I'm going to say from fast API import and then make sure you look at the capitalization here fast api this is the first thing we need to do we're going to import this fast api class module whatever and then we're going to say app is equal to and then fast api with an open parenthesis and a closing parenthesis what this will do is create kind of i guess like let's say an api object something that's going to initialize our api and say okay this app variable right here this is telling us we just created our first fast api Regardless is what you always need to do when you are starting uh, working with fast API. OK, so now that we have this, we can create an endpoint. And at this point in time, I'm going to stop for a second, quickly discuss what an endpoint is. So if you hear me say endpoint or root or route or whatever, what that really means is something like slash hello slash, you know, get hyphen item. So when when you're talking about an endpoint, you have a kind of base server URL. In our case, our base URL is going to be localhost because we're not distributing this app or uh, kind of, I guess, deploying this app. We're just hosting it on our local machine. So the base URL would be localhost and then the endpoint would be slash hello. And so you have all of these different endpoints. And when you go to these different endpoints, well, different stuff happens, right? Different information will be sent back to you. Maybe you're sending information to an endpoint. But regardless, that's what I mean by endpoint slash something essentially, right? It's kind of like the ending path after the main domain. So if you were looking at, you know, like Facebook.com, an endpoint would be like slash home, right? That would be one of the endpoints for Facebook.com. Regardless, that's an endpoint. So to create an endpoint, what you do is you say app dot and then the method that this endpoint is going to kind of accept or that is going to be. So when we talk about HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol, I believe that's what that stands for. At least we have some main different methods. So whenever you set up an endpoint, you can set it up to kind of be a different method, if that makes sense. I'm having trouble coming up with the exact word for it. But the idea is we have these kind of core HTTP methods and they all mean something different. Now, one of the main ones is get we have post, we have put and then we have delete and we have a few other ones as well. But these are kind of the four core ones. Now, when you set up a get request or you have an endpoint that has a get method, what this means is that this endpoint is going to be returning information. That's kind of all it's doing is you're asking this endpoint to get something for you and return it to you. That's kind of the get HTTP method. Now, when we talk about post, this actually means that you're going to be sending information to the post endpoint or this endpoint here that is method post will be creating something new. Whenever you're creating data, kind of adding something to the database, you're doing this with a post request. So you would be maybe posting a new user login or something, right? Or a new user sign up, right? You would post that to an endpoint because you're going to create a new user in the database because they just registered or signed up or whatever. And then put this is to actually update something that's already existing in the database. Uh, just, you know, kind of modify information essentially and then delete. Well, that's straightforward. You're deleting something, getting rid of information. Now, of course, there's a few more, but these are the core ones and the ones that I'll show you. So depending on the method you want your endpoint to be, you're going to say app dot and then the method. So in this case, I'm going to go with get and then you're going to put the endpoint right here. So I'm going to say slash and make sure, sorry, before the app, you put this at symbol right here. I'll discuss why we need that in a second. So for now, I'm going to set up what I'm going to call my home endpoint. And what this is going to do is just return 
some data that says test. So what I've just done is I've said at app.get, I've defined my kind of root or endpoint as slash. I've then created a function. I've called this home. Make sure that your kind of root or endpoint is right above the function that will be triggered when you go to this root. And then what you're going to do is return some Python dictionary. This will be kind of the data or the information that's going to be returned when you go to this endpoint. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. But if we go to slash now, once we kind of run this web server, what will happen is the information data with the key test will be returned. So this is how you kind of set up a root. You say at app dot whatever the method is. Again, the root, you define a function right underneath it. You can name this function whatever you want, and then you return some information. OK, there we go. So let me just show you how we can run this. Then I'll talk about uh, what's known as JSON and kind of what an API is and, and actually how that works. So what I'm going to do here is go to my command prompt and I need to change directories into the folder or into the directory where my Python script is. So in this case, I'm on Windows. I'm starting in my home folder. So I'm going to go to CD desktop and then I'm going to CD into fast API. Then what I'm going to say is UV corn. This is the thing we just installed. And I'm going to say the name of my file, which is working. Notice I'm not adding the dot pi. You don't want the dot pi. So make sure you don't have that. And then, oops, what did I just do here? OK, I, I've messed up my cursor somehow. Anyways, UV corn working colon. You're going to then say app app being the name of the variable that you have fast API stored in and then space hyphen hyphen reload. Now, what this hyphen hyphen reload will do is tell UV corn to constantly reload the web server every single time you make a change to the Python file that's kind of storing the API. So UV corn, the name of your Python file, mine is working. Notice I don't have the .py extension. Then the name of the variable storing fast API, colon, colon, or sorry, hyphen, hyphen, reload, and then press enter. And you should see that it says application startup complete. And it shows you the URL right here that you need to go to to access this website or access this API server. So in this case, it's HTTP colon slash slash 127.0.0.1 colon 8000, pretty much the same thing as localhost. So what I'm going to do now is go to my browser and say HTTP slash slash 127.0.0 colon 8000. And I'm not going to go to the docs page quite yet. And here you can see that we get this data saying test because we went to the slash endpoint. So when you just put slash, that means if you go to any endpoint essentially on the server, like if you go to just the default one, so you don't have anything after, sorry, then it's going to return or uh, treat it as if you're at this endpoint. So I, I think I think you guys get what I'm saying. I'm kind of uh, mumbling around here. But the point is that like this, just that is equivalent to the endpoint slash. Regardless, you can see we're getting data test. So now let's do a quick change. To this I'm going to say testing. I'm going to save that. Now I'm going to go here and refresh and notice it says testing. That means our reloading is kind of working. Great. Now what you guys saw, I accidentally loaded this docs page. So we might as well just go to it right now. If you go to your uh, server URL, which is just 127.0.0.1 colon 8000, then slash docs, it will have automatically generated documentation for your API. So at this point, we only have one endpoint. It is slash. The function name is home, right? So that's why it's saying home. And then if you press on this, it says, OK, it doesn't take any parameters. And uh, what is it? If we try it out, so we can try it out by pressing that button and press execute. We can kind of see the sample response body. We can see the request that we sent to get this response. This is a way that you can actually test your API from this docs page right here. All right, so I'm going to quickly discuss what an API is. So an API stands for Application Programming Interface. And really what an API is, is some web service that provides an interface to applications to manipulate and retrieve information. So if we're talking about something like Amazon, Amazon almost definitely, I don't know the internal makeup of Amazon, but almost definitely has an API. Now, they probably have multiple APIs, but one of their APIs may be responsible for handling their kind of inventory system, right? Figuring out what items are in stock, what items are not in stock, how many items are in stock, how much they cost, whatever. We can think of uh, a common API that Amazon may have as an inventory API. Now, this API here is separate from the different front ends that display this information. So if you're talking about Amazon, they have a web app, right? They have a mobile application. They have something that works on like Alexa or Google Home or whatever. They have all of these different services that all rely on the same underlying information. They need to know inventory. They need to know what's in stock. And so rather than writing, you know, five inventory management systems, they would write one 
in the form of an API application programming interface. And now any of their applications that are used by users can access this same information by sending requests to the API. So when you go to the you know website and you look up, uh, I don't know, let's say graphics card, right? None of those are in stock right now. What's going to happen is there will be a request that is sent to the Amazon API that says, hey, I'm looking for graphics cards, right? And then it will return all of this information to the front end and display all of that for you. And then when you click on a specific graphics card, it will then say, oh, I need all of the information related to this graphics card. Again, a request will be sent to the API. The API will then send all of that information to the front. And so hopefully that gives you an idea of kind of how the communication works. But the same thing that happens on the mobile app, right? It sends a request to the API. And this way you don't need like five different backends to handle every single one of your applications and all of their information. You have one API responsible for kind of distributing and giving you all of the information that you need. And this is just good practice. Whenever you're kind of writing code, it's a very good idea to separate your front end and your back end. So if, if at any point in time you want to create a different kind of representation of your data on the front end, you can just use the same API. And the only thing you need to change is kind of the way that you're displaying. it. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what an API is and kind of how that works. Now, I don't know the internal makeup of Amazon's web services and all of that kind of stuff. So that could be completely wrong what I described. But that's like an example of where an API might make sense to use. With that said, what I need to quickly talk about is the data that APIs kind of exchange or that I guess anything over HTTP really exchanges. So right here, we returned a Python dictionary. Now, this Python dictionary is actually automatically converted to something known as a JSON JavaScript object notation as soon as it is returned from this function. So fast API actually handles JSONifying all of our information so that we can work with strictly Python types in our actual API. Now, this might seem a little confusing, but whenever you are returning information from an, an endpoint, it's kind of standard that in, that information is in the format of JSON. Now, you don't really have to know what JSON is or what it looks like. It's just a little bit of a different syntax than kind of a standard Python dictionary. And well, you can just understand here that in fast API, any data that you return from your endpoints is automatically converted to JSON. And so wh whoever receives it on the other end may have data that looks a little bit different than what you returned just because it's all going to be converted from kind of vanilla Python types to this JSON format. Now, same thing when these endpoints are receiving information, whenever they get uh, like maybe a query parameter, they get some request body that will come in as JSON and be converted into vanilla Python types. So we don't need to worry about kind of DJSONifying or JSONifying all of our data. Just make sure you understand that all of the data exchange kind of between APIs is in the format of JSON. We're just lucky here that fast API can convert all of this to kind of vanilla Python types for us. Anyways, that was a lot of talking. I hope I didn't bore you guys too much with that. But if you guys are beginners, hopefully that helped you out. Let me know in the comments. Now let's continue working here and let's create a few more endpoints. So I'm going to make a new endpoint here. I'm going to say app.get and let's make this slash about. Now what this is going to do, I'm going to say define about and oops, if I can type about properly and here I'm going to just return some data and I will return, uh, I guess, data and about just so that we have another endpoint so we can see kind of how this works when we look at the auto documentation. So now my web server should have refreshed. If I go to docs now, notice I have another endpoint called about, right? And if I press on this, I can press try it out. I can press execute. And when I execute that, notice that we get our data, we get about. Now, same thing here. If I go to slash about, we can see that we have data about. Awesome. So that is kind of two examples of using an endpoint that has the get method. Now, we also can use an endpoint that has the post method, the patch method and the delete method. But before we do that, I want to show you something known as path parameters and query parameters. And to do that, we're going to kind of get into our first example here. So I want to treat this API that we're creating as kind of an inventory management system, like the example I gave you from Amazon. So I'm going to say inventory. I think I spelled that correctly is equal to and we're going to make this a dictionary. Now, inside of here, we're going to store a bunch of different like stock, right? All of the different items that we may have in stock and all of these items will have a unique ID. So the key in this dictionary will be their ID. So I'm going to say, you know, item with ID one. The name of this item is a let's just say milk. Maybe we'll treat this like a grocery store or something. The uh, price of this item is I don't know how much is milk. Let's say three ninety nine. 
and we will say maybe the expiry uh this could be actually i don't want to do like a date time thing right now let's do something else milk maybe we'll just say brand and actually i don't even know like a milk brand we'll just say uh regular now of course there could be a lot more information we're just kind of doing this simply for now because we don't need to go into anything like crazy advanced okay regardless we have name we have price we have brand and then we have an id for this item so what i'm going to do is set up an endpoint that can retrieve for us item information based on its id so what i'm going to do is say uh at app dot get this is going to be a get method for this endpoint i'm going to say get uh hyphen item and then what i want is the user to actually pass me some id for this item and so what i'm going to do is put inside of curly braces item underscore id now what this means when i do this is that whatever is here could be anything right this item id could literally be anything and based on what this item id is i'm going to return something different from this endpoint so now i'm going to say define get underscore item and now what i need to do is define a variable to represent this item id so i'm going to say item underscore id needs to match the name here colon int now what this is is a type hint in python whenever you do a colon beside a parameter and then you define the type it's known as a type hint and the reason we do this in fast api is to tell fast api that this item id is supposed to be an integer so if you try to pass something that is not an integer uh, to this endpoint for the item ID, it will automatically return to you. We don't have to do this. Fast API will automatically return an error message saying, hey, this wasn't an integer. It needs to be an integer. And I'll show you how that works. But this is our first example of what's known as a path parameter. So now what I'm going to do is just return. And I'm going to return my inventory at the item underscore ID. So let's just go ahead and have a look at this and see how this works. I'm going to go to now the endpoint slash, and this was get hyphen item and then slash one. Now, when I do that, notice it gives me all of the information relating to that item. So I have the name, which is milk price, 399 brand regular. Awesome. But now if I try to go to something that is two, we get an internal server error. The reason we get that is there is no item with ID two. And so this line right here cause an error. I'll show you how we fix that after, but just want to show you that. And then finally, if I try to do something like go to milk, notice that we get this detailed error message saying, hey, uh, this value is not a valid integer. You need to give us a valid integer and even tells us the item ID is the thing that is incorrect. And so that is how you set up a kind of path parameter. Now you can also set up multiple path parameters. Maybe we have items that have the same ID, or maybe we just want some more information from this user. This example isn't going to make too much sense, but I'll just show you how this works. We can take an item ID and we can take something like, I don't know, maybe a name, right? Now that we have this name here, we would need to go inside of our, uh, what do you call it? Uh, parameters here and define name colon string saying that, okay, this name right here, this is expected to be a string. And then what we could simply do is we could return uh, inventory item ID and maybe we could add something to this. I'm trying to think how I would do this. Uh, I can say dot update and hmm, actually, no, this isn't going to quite work. Uh, there's not really a way for me to return the name string that's going to make sense. So anyways, I just wanted to show you we could take multiple path parameters. So now if I go here and I refresh this, so let's go get item one slash test. Notice that this still works. This is totally fine. We took another path parameter in and well, all is good. So hopefully that kind of makes sense, but this is how you take multiple path parameters inside uh, of your kind of endpoint. All right, so sorry for the abrupt cut. I had some issue with my editing software. Anyways, what I'm gonna show you now is how we can add some more detail to our path parameters. So I'm gonna remove name because we don't really want this one anymore. So I'll get rid of this uh, from the actual parameters. And now what I'm gonna show you is something known as path. So we're going to import this function called path. And what we can do is set our item ID colon int equal to and then this path uh, kind of function right here. Now, what this is going to do is allow us to add some more detail or kind of some more enforcements or constraints on our actual path parameter. So, for example, if I wanted to add a description to this path parameter to tell the user what this actually is, like the information they should pass for item ID, I could say something like description is equal to and then I can write a description. And for my description, I'll just say the ID of the item you'd like to view. OK, and then one thing here before I do description, I always need to give a default value for this. So I'm going to say none. Uh, and then description, the ID of the item you'd like to view. 
Now, I understand this might look a little bit weird, but whenever you use these type of functions inside of the parameters for an endpoint, you always have to start with the default value for this parameter. So if item ID wasn't passed, what should this default to? In this case, it's going to default to none. So if you don't pass an item ID, by default, it will be none. However, you'll see since we're talking about path parameters here, it is actually required that you pass an item ID. Uh, so we will never end up using the default value. I know this might be a little bit confusing. This will make more sense once we move on to the next thing, which is the query parameters, which can be optional. Regardless, I'm going to put none here and I'm going to say description equals the ID of the item you'd like to view. Now, if I go back here and let's just refresh this. So get item one, you can see all is good. And if now I go to my docs, you can see that says get item item ID and notice that now there's actually a description. It says the ID of the item you'd like to view because we added that description uh, inside of this kind of path thing right here. Now, what we can also do is uh, have some constraints on item ID to make sure it's say greater than one or greater than some value. So what I'm going to do is say GT, this stands for greater than, and then I'm going to say this is equal to and make it equal to zero. So now what this is saying is, okay, this item ID must be greater than zero. Now, an another few ones you can use here is LT that stands for less than that means this must be less than zero. You can do LE. Uh, that's less than or equal to. And then you can do GE that's greater than or equal to. And you can do kind of any combination of them. So I could do maybe uh, let's say GT zero and LT equals two. So now the only valid thing you can pass is an ID of one. If you pass anything else, you're going to get an error. So let's test this out. Let's first just refresh this here. And I don't think it actually tells me the uh, greater than like enforcement here. But if I go to slash get hyphen item slash two. Notice we get a problem. It says message ensure this value is less than two, right? Because uh, this did not meet the less than constraint. Now, if I do one, all is good. And if I try to do zero, we get an error here saying, no, this is not valid. Make sure this number is greater than zero. Hopefully that makes sense. But that is kind of the basics of using this path thing right here. Okay, so now we've talked about path parameters. The next thing to talk about is query parameters. So a query parameter is something that comes after the question mark in a URL. So sometimes you'll see something like, I don't know, maybe let's go facebook.com and then some endpoint slash home. And then there's something like question mark and it says like, you know, key equals whatever. It says like redirect equals and then maybe some page. And the thing is, this is what's known as a query parameter. So whenever you have a question mark, and then you have some variable name equals and then some value. This is a query parameter and you can have multiple of them. Let's just make the redirect like slash Tim. And then we would do an ampersand and then we would say, you know, MSG equals fail. And now we have two query parameters redirect, which is equal to Tim and MSG, which is equal to fail. So how do we accept query parameters for our endpoint? So I'm going to make a new endpoint here and show you how we do this. I'm going to say app dot get. Uh, and I will make this get by name, get by colon name. And what this is going to accept is one query parameter. And this query parameter is going to be the name of the item that we want to kind of retrieve. And so what I'm going to do here is say name colon str. Now what this is saying is, OK, we are going to accept one query parameter named name. So by default, if it does not see this variable that you've defined as a parameter, in the path to the endpoint, it will by default be a query parameter. So this means we are looking to accept a parameter called name, which is equal to a string. So I'll show you how this works, but that's kind of what this means. And now what we would need to do inside of here is we need to look through our inventory and find something that has the name of whatever the name is that it was passed. So what I'm going to do is make a for loop here. I'm going to say for item in inventory. And actually, this should be for ID in inventory. Actually, I can't call it ID. I'll call it item underscore ID. I'll say for item ID in inventory. If inventory at item underscore ID at name is equal to the name, then what we will do is return inventory at item underscore ID. Otherwise, so if we get to the end of this and that didn't work, we'll return something that says data not found. OK, so now we've created an endpoint. It's taking one query parameter named name. So let me show you how we would actually call this endpoint. So if I go here now and I change this to be get, what do we call this? Get by name. 
So get by hyphen name. And then I do a question mark and I say name is equal to and then milk. Notice that this works and we get the item that has the name milk. Now, if I make this equal to something else, I say name equals Tim. We get data not found because, well, there is no inventory item that has the name Tim. Now, if we don't pass any query parameter and we just do this, it's telling us, hey, this field is required. We need a query parameter. You can't call this endpoint unless you have this query parameter name. And we could add multiple query parameters as well. We could add like price. We could add a brand, whatever, if we wanted to do that. And so anyways, now let me show you how we can add more detail to our query parameters and how we can make them potentially optional. So right now we put name in here, it's equal to a string. And this by default is a required query parameter, but maybe we don't want this to be required. Maybe we want it so that you can call this endpoint without this query parameter. In that case, we would simply set this equal to none. And now what this means is since this has a default value, this query parameter is no longer required. It automatically becomes optional. So if I save this now and I go back and I just run this, notice that this works. We don't get an error anymore because now this query parameter name is strictly optional. We can pass it, but we don't have to. And by the way, it's recommended from uh, the fast API docs that you do the following when you have an optional parameter. You say from typing import, and then you're going to import optional. And then you make this type here optional string. Now you don't have to do this. You saw that this worked when we didn't do this, but this is just going to give a uh, better auto completion for your editor when you decide to do this. So optional is strictly for like yourself, like the developer. It just makes it easier to get better autocomplete when you're writing code here. Uh, you do optional string to note that yes, this parameter here name is indeed optional. So if I run this, you'll see when I save this, this still works. This is totally fine. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. That's how you do a query parameter. Just to show you quickly, we could do another query parameter. I could say, uh, let's just make this one test. Maybe this would be an int and maybe we want this one to be mandatory. You do have to pass test. So now that I've done this, this means that if I refresh this now, uh, let me go here and just, just hit enter. Oh, what is this name string non default argument falls? Ah, okay. This is actually a good error to run into. Let me discuss this. So we just got an error here saying that a non default argument came after a default argument. So for fast API, it does not matter the order in which you kind of write out these different parameters. So it doesn't matter if you have like, you know, item ID first, or if you have name first, or if you have test first, fast API will be able to figure it out. It doesn't matter what order you put it in. However, for Python, it actually gets kind of mad when you put something that's not uh, or put something that is mandatory after something that's not mandatory. And so the way to fix this is to, well, you could reorder this, put test first. When I say that, I mean, we could do test like that. Or what we can do is simply add an asterisk like this and then do a comma. Now, if we do this, everything will work. Essentially, this is uh, it's kind of hard to explain exactly what this does, but this says, OK, let this function accept unlimited keyword arguments or unlimited, sorry, positional arguments. And then the rest of them should be treated as keyword arguments. I'm not really going to explain why that works, but if you get some error saying, hey, you know, your parameters are all ordered wrong, just put an asterisk first and then this will fix it for you. So if I go here and I refresh this now, you can see it says field required. Uh, we're looking for uh, oops, get by name message field required type uh, query test. OK, sorry, I'm just trying to decipher that. So now it's all working. But if I now say test is equal to two, you can see we're all good because we passed the mandatory keyword argument and I can pass another keyword argument, say name is equal to milk. If I do this correctly, press enter and uh, what is it? Message value is not. Oh, sorry. This needs to be an ampersand, not a question mark. So let me try to fix this ampersand. OK, and now we're good. Now we get the item milk. OK, hopefully that's clear. That kind of covers the uh, what do you call it? keyword arguments or sorry, not keyword arguments, query. Yes, query parameters. That's what it's called. Now, let me just show you how we can combine query parameters and uh, path parameters together. So let's say get item by name. We wanted to accept a path parameter as well as a few query parameters. Maybe we wanted the item ID and we wanted the name. I don't know why you'd want that, but maybe you do. So in this case, we can say item underscore ID. And now what we need to do is make sure we have a variable called item ID that is inside of the get name parameter. It doesn't matter where we put it. I'm just going to put it first. I'm going to say item ID colon int. And now this will work. We can now accept our item ID as a path parameter, our name as an optional keyword, sorry, optional query parameter, and then test as a mandatory query parameter. 
So now if I do this and I go here and I refresh, we get not found. But if I go slash one slash and then question mark, notice this works, right? We're all good. And yeah, th that's that's fine. So hopefully that kind of illustrated to you how that works. But that is how you can combine path arguments and query arguments. OK, so now that we've looked at query and path parameters, we're going to move on and talk about the request body. So oftentimes, especially when you're trying to kind of add information to a database, you're not going to be sending all of this information in query parameters or path parameters. You're going to be sending like a bunch of information as what's known as the request body. So I'm going to set up an endpoint here. I'm going to say at app dot post. So a new method this time, I'm going to say slash create item. Now, what we're going to do is kind of change this a little bit so that we are now going to have an endpoint that allows us to create a new item in the database. So I'm going to say define create underscore item. And what I want to accept here is a request body. I want some information uh, relating to the item. So I want the name of the item, the price of the item, and potentially like the brand of the item as well. And so what I'm going to do here is say item. And this is going to be equal to a type that we haven't defined yet, which is called item. So whenever I'm looking for a request body, so I want something that is not a query parameter and I want something that's not a path parameter. I need to set it equal to a class that inherits from something known as base model. Now, I'll kind of discuss this in more depth in a second, but we're going to go up to the top of our program and say from pydantic import base model. Now, what I can do is create a class. I'm going to say class item. This inherits from base model and I can now define in this class the kind of structure of the data that I am looking to accept as uh, this item parameter right here for create item. So I'm going to say, well, I want a name. This is of type string. I also want a price. This is of type float. And then what else do I want? Well, I want a brand and this is going to be optional because I don't know if I am going to take a brand every time string equal to none. So just like it worked for the query parameters and the path parameters, if you want to make it optional, you can add this kind of optional thing. That's not required, but it's good practice. And then make it equal to none or make it equal to some default value. And that now makes brand optional. Awesome. So now that we have that, I'm going to save this. And what this can do, uh, let me actually just go here and let me just return kind of an empty dictionary for now, just so we can see how this works. But since this is equal to this class, right? This is now telling fast API that, OK, this is for the request body. This isn't a query parameter, so it's not expecting me to do something like question mark item equals and then type it all out. It knows that I'm going to be sending this item information in the request body. OK, so I'm just going to go here and refresh this and uh, let's go and see if, if something went wrong. OK, it looks like everything is good. So now if we're looking at our documentation, we see we have this new endpoint called create item. So look, it says that the request body is required. We're looking for a name, a price and a brand. Uh, and if we wanted to try this out, we could, although right now it's not really going to work. It's not going to do anything. Although if I press try it out and I I, just, I can just send this and I press execute. Notice that we're just getting kind of an empty uh, response because we haven't typed anything out. So what I want to do now, though, is I want to take this item and I want to actually insert it into the inventory. And what I can do is rather than like trying to create a structure that looks like this, I can just insert this actual item itself, uh, which you'll see in one second. So what I'm going to do here is now change create item. So it also accepts an ID. So I want an item underscore ID. The reason I want an item ID is because if I'm going to insert this item, well, I need an ID associated with it. So now I also need an item ID here. So I'm going to say item ID colon int. Now this is going to be assumed to be a path parameter because it's in the path, right? So we have our item for the request body and we have our item ID. Uh, that is a path parameter. Awesome. So now the first thing I'm going to do is check to see if this item ID already exists. I'm going to say if item ID is in and then this would be inventory. Uh, let's go here. Then what I want to do is just return and we'll say error item already exists or item ID already exists. Great. Now, if that's not the case, we can just add this item into uh, the inventory. So what I could do is say something like inventory at and then item underscore ID is equal to and I could say name is equal to item dot name. I could say brand is equal to oops to item dot brand and then price is equal 
to item.price. Now we'll leave it like this for a second, but I'll show you kind of a better way to do this. But I just want to show you this is how you access all of the fields from this item, right? You just use dot name, dot brand, and uh, dot price like that. And now we would have added this item to the inventory. And now what I'm going to do is return a response. And what I'm actually going to return is just inventory at item ID just to indicate that, hey, this was all good. Now your item is in, in the inventory and we just return the same item back to them. So now I think that's all working. OK, good. So let's refresh this. Uh, just sometimes it glitches out and you have to like press enter in your terminal to like refresh the web uh, web app, web service, whatever it is. Uh, anyways, we're going to have create item now. So if I go to create item, what I can do is say try it out. Notice that now we have a required item ID. Since this is required, what I'm going to do is pass uh, an ID of two. I'm going to say name and we'll make this name equal to eggs. This price will be like four ninety nine and then the brand. Well, we actually don't need the brand. So let me just remove that. And now let's press execute. So now when we do this, notice that we get our response body saying name eggs brand null price four ninety nine. That's now added into the database. So now if I go to get item and I try to get item uh, of ID two and I press execute, you're going to see, oh, that we get this issue. Ensure the value is less than two. So obviously we need to fix that. We need to make it so that we're no longer checking if the uh, what is it if we're less than two, because we don't really want that constraint. OK, so if I save this now and then I go back, you'll actually see that if I uh, try to run this, we're not going to get anything. The reason we don't get anything is because this uh, these items are being stored in our memory. So as soon as the server refreshes, any items that we added are automatically going to disappear. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. But since this is just a Python dictionary, it's not persistent. It resets every time the server restarts. And so that item we just added is now gone. But I promise you it would work now. We would be able to get that item. But as I was saying, this probably isn't the best way to insert items because, well, I'm just kind of like copying stuff that we already have. What I should do instead is just insert the item object into the dictionary. And then if I actually go ahead and return this, this will still work the exact same way because fast API is smart enough to take this object and convert it into JSON since it inherits from base model. So we don't need to do anything fancy to convert this to a Python dictionary. We can just return the item itself and this will still work. But what that means is that now if we're going to be inserting kind of item objects into our dictionary, we need to change the way that we're looking up items. So rather than saying uh, if item or if inventory item ID at name, we're going to say if inventory item ID dot name equals equals name, then return inventory at item ID. And now that should be good and all should be working. But we have one problem here. We need to change uh, this inventory object right here to be an instance of item, or we can just remove it and have an empty inventory to start, which is actually what I'm going to do. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. I know I'm going like kind of fast through this, but uh, there you go. That's how you create a new item and that's how you take in a request body. So let's just test this out. Let's go here and just uh, refresh the docs. OK, now let's go to create item. Let's make an item. So let's try it out. Let's say item ID one. Uh, let's just make this eggs two ninety nine. Again, we won't have a brand here. Execute. Looks like everything is good. We inserted this item. So now let's do another item. Let's do ID two. Let's make this milk. OK, let's make our price four ninety nine and uh, we can add a brand for this one. Let's say brand is equal to large and let's go execute. And there you go. We got that item. So now if we go here to get item by name, let's look for an item named milk. Notice that we do get that item. Let's look for an item named eggs. Notice that we get that item. And now let's go look by ID. And if we go for ID one, we can see we get eggs. If we go for ID two execute, we see we get milk. All right. So that is awesome. That is all working. Next thing I'll show you is how we do a uh, how we actually update an item. So if I say app dot and then I'm going to use put put is to update, right? I'm going to say slash we'll call this update item. And then what we'll take here just to kind of mix it up is actually a query parameter. So the query or sorry, uh, not a query parameter will take a path parameter. So I'm going to say item underscore ID. And I guess we're not really mixing it up because we just did it here. But regardless, I'll call this update underscore item. And what we'll take here is item underscore ID. That's an int. And then we want a request body as well. And so I will say item 
and I'll make this equal to item. So now all I'm going to do here is the exact same thing I did previously. I'm going to say if item ID in inventory literally have the exact same. So if item ID uh, in inventory, oh, sorry, not in inventory, then I'll say error item ID does not exist because notice we're updating an item here, not creating a new one. So item ID does not exist. And then if the item did exist, what we'll do is just override that item with the new, um, what do you call it? The new item that was just passed to us. And in fact, I'll show you kind of a fancier way to do this. I'm going to say inventory at item ID dot update with item. So what this dot update will do is take in the kind of dictionary or JSON that is this item, and it will use it to update the item that we have. Now, what that will mean is that if we don't pass name, price, brand, so on and so forth, uh, it will not change the name and the price and all of those other things. So if we just passed name, then it would only update the name of this item. If we just pass price, it would only update the price. If we passed any combination of these, it would update any combination of them. The only problem, however, is though, since we have this equal to item, that means that it's requiring us to take name and take price in. So instead, what I'm going to do is make a new class and call this update item. And all I'm going to do is change these all to be optional. So I'm going to say equals none equals none. And then uh, we'll make this optional like that. So let's go optional like that. OK, so now this should be good. We're going to change this type now to be update item like that. OK, so hopefully you guys are clear, but this should just update the item for us. So now we're going to have to go and add a few sample items. So let's refresh this here. Uh, notice that now we have this update item, which is a put request. So let's just go to uh, our post and let's create an item item ID one. We can just make this milk again, price of two ninety nine, and then we won't include a brand. OK, so now if I execute this, I think we're all good. Nice. So let's now update this item. So to update this item, what I'm going to do is try this out item ID one. And now I will only include a brand. So if I only include a brand now and I make this equal to large and I press execute uh, internal server error, what is the error here? Item object has no attribute update. Oh, OK. Sorry, guys, I had a little bit of mistake here. I kind of was thinking that this inventory item ID is equal to uh, a Python dictionary, which we could use the update method on. It's not equal to a Python dictionary. So instead, we're going to have to update doing something a little bit differently. What I'm going to do is say inventory at item ID dot name is equal to. And then this is going to be item dot name. But we'll say if item dot name does not equal none else, we won't do anything. So actually, mm, I think we'll have to change this a bit. OK, I'm just going to say if item dot name does not equal none then inventory at item ID dot name is equal to item dot name. And then we'll do the same thing for brand and the same thing for price. Kind of an annoying way to do the update here, but just what we have to do. So I'm going to say item dot price, item dot price, item dot price. And then same thing here. If item dot brand and then brand and then brand. OK, so again, the reason I have to do this is because I thought it was a Python dictionary, thought I could use that update update command. But since it's not a Python dictionary, it's an instance of this object. We have to kind of manually update it. And so what I'm going to do now is oops, didn't, I guess running that's not really going to do anything. Uh, let's rerun our server here. Let's go and let's refresh. We're going to have to create an object. So let's just make one fast one. We'll say this is of type milk, say price two ninety nine, and then we won't include a brand. OK, let's go execute uh, all good. What does it say? Executing property name enclosed in double quotes. Um, hmm. OK, so the reason that was uh, glitching out was I had a comma here and I can't have a comma at the end if I don't have another value after. And so anyways, we just created the item. You can see we have name, price and brand is equal to no. OK, so now that we have that, uh, what I'm going to do is try to update this item. Still not quite sure if this is going to work, but let's go to item ID. Uh, what was the ID we inserted? I think it was just one. OK, one. And now let's just include a brand. So we're going to say brand and we'll just make this equal to large and let's execute. And now notice that we updated the brand here and we made it large. So now if we were to change this and we remove brand and we make this 
name and we change the name, which is supposed to be lowercase, to be uh, eggs, because right now I think it's milk. Yeah, it is milk. And we execute this. Notice that now we've updated the name of this to be eggs. And so that is how you can update an item. And now if we go and we look for an item, so get item by name, we can look for the name eggs. And notice that we are getting eggs. Now, of course, we could do this the manual way. Get underscore item or get, what is it? Hyphen item. Actually, what did I call this? I want to make sure I don't mess this up. Uh, get by name. Okay, get by name. And then this is question mark. And the name that we pass is name equal to eggs. It works the manual way as well. Awesome. Okay, so that is kind of it for the put and for the post. Now let's do one for delete. Okay, so to do the delete method is pretty straightforward. We're going to say at app dot delete. We're going to say slash delete hyphen item. And then we'll just take an item ID. Actually, let's take the item ID as a query parameter just to do that. We'll say define delete underscore item. We're going to say uh, item underscore ID. This will be an int. And we'll make this equal to a query. And just to add some uh, kind of info here, I'll say dot, dot, dot. And to make sure that this is going to be required, not optional. And then I will say description is equal to the ID of the item to delete. And then I will say greater than equals zero so that it must be greater than zero. OK, now what I can do is check if this item exists. So I'll say if item ID is in the inventory, then we can delete it. Uh, so we could do this the other way. Actually, I'll say if item ID not in inventory, then what we want to do is return error ID does not exist. OK, otherwise we will simply say Dell inventory at and then item underscore ID. Awesome. So now this endpoint should be working. So now let's go to our docs. So let's go slash docs. Now notice we have this endpoint for delete. It's automatically documenting all of it, right? Another great thing about fast API. We go to create item. We can make an item. So item ID one. Let's just leave it default. We'll just we'll just execute one with name string. And now let's delete this item. So first thing, let's just make sure it exists. So item ID, try it out one. We get this item. OK, now if we go to delete and all we do is try it out, we pass item ID one and execute this. Uh, response body no oh because we didn't return anything from here that's fine but it should have deleted the item because now if i go and look for this item so i go here to get item by id and press execute we get an internal server error because well we don't have that item now let me just return something here let me just return um you know success item deleted or something okay item deleted exclamation point Okay, so that's good. We now have the update, create, delete, and then get by name and get by ID. All right, so now we're nearing the end of this tutorial, and I'm going to show you how you can actually return different status codes from these uh, these endpoints. Because you can see here that, for example, I'm returning like some data that says error ID does not exist, but the status code when I return this is still going to be whatever the default status code of delete is, and that's no good. Now, if you're unfamiliar with status codes, every single time you call an HTTP endpoint, it will return to you some status code that indicates kind of what happened. The default is 200. That stands for OK. 201 is created 404 as you've probably seen before is not found. Uh, there's a bunch of status codes. You don't have to memorize them, obviously, but I'll show you how you can return like an error status code rather than just returning some data that has the same status code as whatever the default you know, return status code of delete is. And the way you do that is you go up to fast API, you import HTTP uh, in all capitals exception like that, and then you import something called status. All right, so import both of those. Now I'm going to go to a uh, place where we have some error message. So here it's saying data not found. And rather than returning data not found, when you want to actually give some type of error message with a different status code, you just raise a Python exception. So if you raise exception, and this exception should be HTTP exception, what you can do is uh, indicate the status code. So you say uh, status code like that, make it equal to whatever code you want. In this case, I can say something like 404. Or I can use the status dot then HTTP underscore 400 or underscore 404 underscore not 
underscore found. I think that's what it's called. So this kind of status module here has like the actual names of all of these status codes in them. If you'd prefer to type it out this way, when you do status dot HTTP underscore 404 not found, this whole thing is just equal to 404. It just makes it easier to kind of read it out. Anyways, I just want to show you that I'm not going to use status, but you guys can use status if you want what's known as like the enum for each uh, value. And then you can say, uh, let me check here in my cheat sheet. I believe it's detail and you can give the detail of why this uh, this error was returned. So I can say detail and say item ID not found or something like that or, or item name not found. OK, so let's just copy this and let's paste this in all the other places we have an error. So rather than raising this error, we'll say item ID already and then exists. And I don't know what stats code we should use for this one. I'm just going to use 400. I think 400 stands for bad request. Um, I'm not too fussed about doing this all properly. I just am trying to show you how we can raise these errors. And then let's raise another one here. So rather than item does not exist, we'll just do 404. We'll say item ID does not exist. And then do we have any more errors? This one as well. So we can just copy this exact same thing. So raise HTTP error. Let's copy it here. And there we go. We are now good. And just to give you an idea of what's going on when we do this in the back end. So in fast API, it's kind of waiting for one of these exceptions to be raised. When it's raised, it will automatically return the equivalent kind of HTTP response so that we don't have to do it manually. Instead, we can just raise an exception. So let's now go here and let's refresh our docs. I'm going to have to uh, press enter in here. OK, reloading. That's all good. Now what I'm going to do is go to get item. Let's try to get an item ID one. When we do this, oh, I forgot we haven't uh, fixed get item by ID. OK, let's let's not do that one. Let's get item by name. Let's look for an item. Let's look for eggs. When we do this, notice we get detail item not found. And our response code was 404 as opposed to 200, which we would have gotten previously. All right, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. Let's go and try to create an item. So let's go try item one. Let's just execute that. OK, let's try to do it again. When I try to do it again, you're going to see here that we get detail item ID already exists and we get status code 400 telling us, hey, this was a bad request. You can't do that right now. If I go to update item and I try to update item ID two, let's go like that again. Same thing. Item ID does not exist. We're getting the correct response. All right. So I think with that, that's actually going to wrap up this video. Hopefully this gave you and I'm just going to zoom out so you guys can look at all this code here on kind of one screen. Hopefully this gave you a decent idea of how to get started with fast API. I know I went into like a lot of probably unnecessary detail for a lot of this stuff, but I just want to make sure you guys understand the difference between the path query and kind of request body arguments or parameters. That's very, very important. And once you understand that, like you saw here, we created pretty well a fully functioning API in not very many lines of code. Now, obviously you would want to change this inventory to be an actual database, but if you're just working on something simple and want to get it up and running fast, fast API is a great choice. And yeah, I mean, I hope this helped you understand the framework. If it did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I will see you in another YouTube video.